Hello and welcome to Digging for Britain, the programme which brings you this year's most outstanding new archaeology. Once again, over the last year, archaeologists were busy unearthing our history in hundreds of digs across Britain. They've gone to extraordinary lengths to uncover long-lost treasures, retelling our story in a way that only archaeology can. And our archaeologists have been out filming themselves to make sure that we were there for every moment of discovery. Go on. Fantastic. It's a two. And they'll be joining us back here at the National Museum of Scotland to help us make sense of what these new finds actually mean. In this series, we'll be touring Britain, and tonight we're in the north. We discover one of the biggest and best preserved Roman forts in Britain. And we catch the very moment when a Viking boat burial is unearthed. And see how rescue archaeologists are fighting the elements to save a rare Iron Age site. Over a million and a half people visit the National Museum of Scotland every year. They come to see some of the 20,000 artefacts that illustrate key moments in our history. From the Pennycook jewels, kept safe by a lowly servant after Queen Mary's execution in 1587, to Bonnie Prince Charlie's picnic set that he brought into combat with the English at the Battle of Culloden. Our first story takes us to Orkney and to one of the northernmost digs in Britain. I've had the privilege of visiting Orkney on numerous occasions and I've seen some truly astonishing archaeology there. Back in 2010, I saw the Westry Wifey, which is the earliest depiction of a human from the British Neolithic. In 2011, I was lucky enough to see an intact Neolithic tomb being opened. But in recent years, the most astonishing discovery has been at the Ness of Brodga, which is quickly becoming the most important Neolithic site in Britain. Sitting right in the heart of the Neolithic Orkney World Heritage Site is the Ness of Brodga. Along with nearby Skara Bray and Mays Howe, it now belongs amongst the most famous prehistoric sites in Britain. Our ancestors settled to farm, trade and thrive on this land over 5,000 years ago. And because they built in stone, their traces are still visible all over the island. At Skara Bray, we find elaborate stone houses. And at May's house, it's a huge chambered tomb for the dead. But the Ness of Brodga is becoming another vital piece in this Neolithic puzzle. It's offering unique insights into how our ancestors lived. The team filmed themselves in this, their eighth season, uncovering clues for the world of our ancestors 5,000 years ago. Some of the finds are quite prosaic. You know, it looked like paving or fallen roof slabs. Bang, 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 bang. And I was able to see a really pretty orange sandstone artifact. And some artifacts tell of a confident trading people who roamed the nearby seas. The person who made this and the people who used it and the people who saw it at the Ness of Brodga back in the Neolithic would have recognised an object which invited parallels with Shetland. In other words, this is an object being made by somebody and used by somebody down here who was aware of traditions of making tools that stretched up through the Northern Isles and up to the Shetland archipelago. It's clear that the Ness of Brodga is important to people in Orkney, but exactly how it was used remains a mystery. But some of the artefacts are pointing to something which could be interpreted as ritualistic, something sacred. 
what we're dealing with here is a fragment of a very classic later Neolithic artifact called a mace head. Like many mace heads at the Ness, we tend to find them in fragmentary conditions. They're broken. A mace head is part of a blunt Stone Age weapon or tool. Now, some of these might have broken during use, but archaeologists believe that others could have been ceremonially decommissioned. We're getting deposits of, of objects like these at the Ness, uh, which suggests that perhaps sometimes we might be dealing with a more deliberate act, where sometimes an object, because of its biography, because of who it was associated with in life, perhaps when that person died, that object had to be taken out of commission, deliberately broken in the way that people might have you know, broken swords um, at the end of a commission or taking weapons out of use. These broken maze heads are adding to a series of finds curated at the National Museum of Scotland. So what have we got here? Well, we have a selection of carved stone objects, all from Scarabray, which is a settlement not too far away from Ness of Brogdon. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's been an awful lot of speculation as to what these things were, what they were for. I think people agree that they were certainly symbols of power. Mm. They're also, they could have been used as weapons because you could deal somebody a pretty painful blow with one of these or you could put a uh, cord around them and swing them around. And indeed, there's at least one skull that's got a depressed blunt fracture, so you know, they could well have been used. With something like this, you could keep it in your fist and deal somebody a horrible blow with a spiky point. One of the things I really love about prehistory is finding objects like this, which are, which are so intriguing and so enigmatic, and I don't think we'll ever really know what they were used for, but we can still really appreciate the art and the, and the skill that went into making them. Oh, exactly. And clearly they would have selected beautiful, aesthetically pleasing stones, probably mm. cobbles from the beach. And uh, they wouldn't have had metal tools, obviously, so they would have used stone tools, sand, water, a lot of elbow grease. Mm. And many, many hours of work went into making something like this. These objects and the smashed pieces of stone maces from the Ness of Brodga suggest that the Ness may have been a ritual site, and every day the team find more evidence. Here we've got um, quite a nice incised stone. Uh, you can see there's various lines crisscrossing each other here, forming kind of chevron, zigzags, patterns here. And this is a kind of piece of Neolithic artwork that's been built into the main structure of the building. We're finding these sort of decorated stones built into all the walls, internally and externally, across the site. The archaeologists believe that this prehistoric artwork is further evidence that this was a ritual complex. And now Nick Card and his team believe that they have found the spiritual centre, a Neolithic temple. Here, we're standing next to Structure 10, the so-called Neolithic Cathedral. It's over probably 25 metres long, 20 metres wide almost. Everything about it would just scream ritual, religion. You still get a sense of what this building must have been like in its heyday. Truly amazing. This Neolithic cathedral has been robbed of its stone over thousands of years, making one of this year's discoveries even more remarkable. The entrance to it, marked by the threshold stone. What we're standing on here is the original entrance. It's about 1.8 metres wide, almost a, a, a metre across. We'd always been a bit wary about where the entrance was, and because of the robbing, this was just not clear at all, as we knew that it had to be facing towards Mays Howe. This connection to the chambered tomb of Mays Howe and the growing acceptance that Orkney's Neolithic monuments could be linked makes the final discovery inside the temple astounding. A standing stone at the center of this ritual complex. The archeologists wonder, was this altar of central importance in Neolithic Orkney? Just half a mile away, you have Maze Howe, a few hundred metres away, Stones of Stenness, and behind us on the skyline, the Ring of Brodga. They all seem to be clustering around the Ness. And I think 5,000 years ago, 
it maybe wasn't the great stone circles, the Ring of Broadgreen, the Stones of Stenness, which today kind of dominate our thinking of this landscape. It really is. It's Nessa Brodga 5,000 years ago that maybe held that kind of very central position. And all these other monuments were maybe just peripheral to what was happening here. This important site really is shaping the archaeological world. You know, we always are kind of a bit London-centric, Southern British-centric, with some of the great monuments like Stonehenge and Wessex area. But this, with the rest of Orkney, is really turning the map on its head. The scale of it, the architecture. It's an archaeologist's dream site. A 5,000-year-old temple at the heart of a sacred landscape, built out of stone over hundreds of years. And what is most amazing of all is that the digging suggests that this entire complex was abandoned almost overnight. So what happens at the end at the Nessa Brodka? Well, Certainly, it seems as though this huge structure 10 was deliberately decommissioned and they marked the occasion by having this ginormous feast with hundreds of cattle. And, of course, we will never know for sure, but we can say it probably wasn't climate change. So there wasn't a tsunami, there wasn't a, a catastrophe. They weren't invaded by other people. I suspect that they had engaged in this, this sort of spiral of increasing investment of effort so that by the time you've built Structure 10 and you've built the Ring of Brodga, you've involved probably most of the population of Orkney. And how then do you top it? So it may well have been a kind of social boom and bust. You know, they couldn't trump it. So they realised that, you know, the number was up. But also it's got a much more complicated story because it seems as though people were coming from the Stonehenge area almost in a pilgrimage kind of way because you get houses at Durrington Walls near Stonehenge that look like the houses at Scarra Bray. It does seem like a golden age for Orkney, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. 5,000 years ago, our ancestors abandoned a cathedral erected here in stone. And this year's archaeology is also telling another story of the shifting power of the gods along the largest frontier ever built on our shores. One of the most obvious footprints of the Romans in Britain is, of course, Hadrian's Wall. Stretching from coast to coast, this 75-mile-long wall divided the wilds of the north from the Romanized south. And dotted along the wall were military garrisons, where Roman soldiers lived, trained and worshipped. Now, recent excavations are changing the way we look at religion along the wall. In 2011, I visited the very start of a dig at the Roman site of Binchester in County Durham. The barracks sprung up in the first century AD when the Roman army was asserting its power in northeast England. The first trenches yielded just animal bone and other refuse as the team searched for clues into the everyday lives of Roman legionaries. Three years on, one of the biggest and best preserved Roman barracks in Britain has emerged, offering insights into all aspects of Roman occupation. I'm standing right in the trench of a Roman communal toilet. Going to a toilet was a, was a social activity in the Roman period. And there would have been a series of perhaps one, two, three, or even four toilet seats next to each other. There's a big conduit coming through, and when it rained, which it does a lot up here in County Durham, that water would have flushed everything through and kept our latrine block cleansed, and uh, Roman Binchester, if not sweet smelling, would have made it a little less unsavoury. Near the Roman toilets, David and his team dug down seven feet 
to reveal another incredible discovery, a Roman bathhouse with plaster still clinging to its walls. The end of our fifth week on site, oh, that's right. and in the last week or so, we have finished clearing out the interior of what you can see is an exceptionally well-preserved Roman bathhouse. Behind me here, you can see we have the benches, and this shows this is probably a Roman changing room. Then David and his team make an important discovery, one that explains the extraordinary preservation of the bathhouse. This is the middle of our final week, week seven at uh, Roman Binchester. Besides me is a, is a deep pit. It goes down about seven or eight courses and you've got a foundation at the bottom. That's much, much deeper than we were expecting it to go. We always thought the bathhouse survived really well because it was partly terraced into the hillside and then it got filled in with lots of Roman rubbish. What's increasingly clear is the building was constructed as a freestanding building and then the street levels outside rose up around it and then, with the rubbish rising up on the inside, the entire thing became embedded in, in Roman archaeology, either side of the walls. The whole structure was filled right up to roof height with massive quantities of Roman rubbish, which basically stopped it falling down. And buried within this rubbish are precious objects that today hold clues for us about religion and worship on these walls. This is a silver ring with a tiny gemstone on it, and on that gemstone is a carved early Christian symbol. And this is found in the fort itself, so this came from one of our, our barracks. Right, so what have we got on there? It's absolutely tiny. It's absolutely it? tiny. You've got a, um, an anchor, and suspended from it are a pair of fish. Um, in, in the 3rd and 4th century, which is when this probably dates from, the cross wasn't yet used as the symbol of Christianity, so instead it was other symbols such as this one, and that's how, that's how we know it, it belongs to the, the early Christian faith. Wow. So what have we got here? What's this? This is the carved head of a, probably of a Roman god, and which we found mixed up with all the rubbish in the bathhouse. OK, so how old is that then? This is probably 2nd or 3rd century AD. Mm. And it's, it's, it's beautiful because it's got the, the, the nice carved hair, kind of classical style hair, but the eyes are, are very, very kind of Celtic looking. The arm and the shape kind of reminds you of the, of the kind of art which the, the local indigenous Britons were making. So we've got the early Roman head there and the late Roman rings. So we're spanning, what, three or four centuries of religion in this, in this site? Yeah, there's a huge amount. We've also found altars, we've found all sorts of other religious objects. And it would have permeated their day-to-day -day existence. So the head and the altars, they came from a bathhouse, they don't come from a temple. But everywhere the Romans were, they're expressing their beliefs. And we also, there's a the transition, isn't there, to Christianity? I mean, the, the head is, can we call it pagan? Uh, and then we've got the Christian symbology on the, on the ring. Absolutely. Christianity becomes a, a kind of legal religion in the Roman Empire in the 4th century. This ring is probably some of the earliest evidence we have for Christianity. Uh, and, and it's nice. It shows that Binchester had a range of different beliefs and that people were probably worshipping pagan gods. At the same time, others were celebrating their Christian belief. Almost a hundred miles along the wall, a team in Maryport has made another important discovery about shifting religious beliefs on the Romans' great frontier. So uh, here we are at uh, Maryport on the Cumbrian coast, and uh, we're about to see the unearthing of a monument that was originally carved in the second century when Maryport was part of the coastal defences linked to Hadrian's Wall. And you can see there some of my colleagues in action. That's the excellent Tony Wilmot, uh, the site director. One and of that's, Britain's... that's lovely. What, Isn't I mean, it great? what is that? Is that an altar? That is indeed an altar. Yeah. Takes your breath away. We're going to get this uh, altar out now, see if it's complete. Um, I'm going to first of all uh, get these big stones out and then uh, John's going to dive in and clean it up, so uh, get cracking. And how close was this site to the wall itself? Well, um, Maryport is actually part of the, the Cumbrian coastal complex. Um, so Hadrian actually extends the line of turrets and towers along the Cumbrian coast from Hadrian's wall. Uh, so we're quite a way south of the actual wall. Complete. Yes, it is. Oh, dear, oh, dear. 
and there you can see the text. I-O-M at the top. That's something to do with Jupiter, I know that. It is indeed. It's Jupiter the best and the greatest, Jupiter Optimus Maximus. And uh, below that, we can actually see uh, who dedicated it. Prefect, Prefect Commanding Officer, VSLM. Um, set it up um, to fulfil a vow. That tells us uh, the name not only of the unit, but of the man, a guy called Atius Tutor. And we've actually got three other dedications by this guy from Maryport. <laughs> this is the bit where the guy is risk a hernia. It's a big thing. Now what we've got to do is get it to the car, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. John Lasky, worthy of Mr Hutton, listen this. What can I say? <laughs> Shattered. <laughs> Yes. 25 years ago, when I started digging at Bird Oswald, I said if anyone found an inscription, there was malt whiskey in it. Right. John? Oh, thank hey. you. That's a fantastic find. And the inscription it just looks so crisp. It does look crisp, doesn't yeah. it? It does look crisp. And uh, that's uh, Cumbrian red sandstone for you. In fact, when we look at it very closely, you can see it has experienced some weathering. How many altars did you find there? We're actually nudging the total of known altar fragments from that site up to about 22, 23 now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So why are they buried in the ground, then? For a long time, the assumption was that as these altars appeared so crisp, and as there were so many that were obviously dedicated in a very short space of time in the second century, often by the same named individual, well, the assumption was that each time a new altar was put up, the one that had been dedicated the year before was buried on the spot. So it was almost like they were being ritually buried. That was to the make, explanation. Make room for the next one. To make room for the next one. But in fact, the Romans don't do things like that. <laughs> we know now they don't do things like that. They were being buried much later. They are dug to support a massive timber structure on the site. So they were being used as foundations? They were being used for foundations, yes. So this is fascinating. Um, these Roman altars then, which obviously had huge ritual significance of the people that, that, that made them and set them up, um, are just being used as foundation stones, they are. As, as objects of, they of are. no ritual significance, really. Mm, not anymore. Uh, Jupiter is no longer the best and the greatest. There's a new landscape at Maryport. From abandoned Roman temples telling the death of an empire, we travel 160 miles south to find ancestors living in Britain just after the end of the Ice Age. One of my favourite prehistoric sites has to be Starcar in East Yorkshire. And we covered this site on a previous series of Digging for Britain, where I talked to Nikki Milner about the astonishing discoveries that she and her team were making. Now, this year, she's been excavating at a nearby site called Flixton Island, and this one goes back even earlier, back beyond 11,000 years ago. Day seven, and we're really excited because we're right on the edge of what would have been the lake, and we've just started finding some animal boats. Well, we've come down into the, uh, the earliest peak. Uh, we've uh, come across what looks like to be horse bones. So we've got uh, a horse pelvis, half of the pelvis, and uh, a horse scapula as well, which is really fantastic to see the preservation of it, considering how old it is. This site dates back almost to the Ice Age. Organic finds from this era are practically unheard of, but Flixton is rewriting the record. 11,000 years ago, this land was an island used by Stone Age hunter-gatherers. When the water that surrounded the island drained, the lake bed turned to peat, preserving vital clues to this lost world. It's day 20 at Flixton Island, and I'm sitting in, some, in front of something very, very exciting indeed. These are actually hoof prints which have been made in the mud by animals over 11,000 years ago. The horses were probably walking along the edge of the lake in muddy conditions. Soon afterwards, sand and gravel gently washed over the print, preserving them in time. 
These are quite small, but we know that they're horse hoof prints because we've actually found horse hooves in the trench. And this is a half of a, a horse hoof. And if I just put that in there, you can see that it actually fits beautifully. And Nikki, here are some of these horse bones from Flexton Island. They're yeah. incredibly well preserved, aren't they? They are. And we've got a, um, a distal phalanx here, the very end of a, of a horse's leg. So that's the bone that sits just underneath the hoof, yes. as we saw in the film. Yes, and that fits nicely into the, the hoof prints on site. They're actually quite small horses, aren't they? I mean, I'm looking at these bones mm. and they are, uh, they are from adult horses. The, the ends of the bones are, are fused to the shaft, so these aren't juveniles, they're adults, but they're small adults. They do seem to be very small um, and probably more like pony size. We've got this, this jaw as well. I mean, this, this is quite small too, and you can see the, the teeth in the end here. And then we've also got a, a piece of a pelvis, which we know is pelvis because this is the bit where the leg bone fits in. Yeah, that's the hip socket. So these are wild horses on Flixton Island? That's right, yes. Um, and uh, they become extinct quite soon after the end of this, this site. And what's really incredible is that this is, uh, these are the last wild horses that we think we've got in Britain. After that, they, they die out. We don't have any Mesolithic sites with, with horses on them. And how rare is this site? It's incredibly rare. We only have about 30 in the whole country, which is a really small number if you compare with other sites of different periods. And um, most of these sites tend to have lots of flint on them. Uh, there's only one other site which actually has any bone on it at all. And so bone from this period is incredibly rare and it just gives us more of an insight into the environment and what people are doing at this time. In fact, it's, it's really, really unique for the, the, the whole of Europe. It's a, it's a very, very important site. As the month-long dig nears its end, clues about human activity also emerge. The team begin to notice that some of the animal skeletons have parts missing. We've got the, the middle bit of the spine here, and it curves around to the lower bit. And then uh, this large bit just here is the sacrum, which is at the bottom of the spine, and that's where the, the hips articulate at. But what's really interesting is that up here, these vertebra would have the ribs attached to them, but they're not there anymore. And the sacrum would have the pelvis attached, but that's not there either. The team believes that humans slaughtered this horse 11,000 years ago on Flixton Island. They must have come over in boats to the island and killed at least six or seven horses and they seem to have just taken away the really meaty parts. It's likely that they were here for a very, very short period of time, just enough for this to have happened, because there's no other evidence of occupation, there's very little flint or anything like that. What I love about being an archaeologist is that you peel back the layers of soil to reveal a past landscape that hasn't been seen for thousands of years. This is amazing for us because it's a period of time which we know very little about, and it gives us a real snapshot into how people were living just after the end of the last ice age. So we do have archaeological artefacts as well from the island? We do. This is a long blade, and we only have a few of these, um, but this is a, a typical tool of that period. And what would it have been used for? Well, we actually know from um, microscopic analysis exactly what this particular blade was used for. It was, first of all, this point was used for piercing through the skin and cutting, cutting through skin. This side was used for butchery of meat. And then right at this bottom end, there's um, polish, which shows that perhaps someone was holding the blade uh, using a very soft cloth. So it's, it's definitely a a blade for butchery rather than a projectile point for killing an animal? Yes, definitely. We have proof it's, it's for butchery. Now, can you be absolutely sure that the humans are implicated in the death of these horses? Because couldn't these horses have died naturally and this could have just been a, an item that was dropped by somebody visiting the island? Well, it's very rare, but we do have a few pieces of bone which do have butchery evidence on them. They've got cut marks, so we are sure that they were actually killed by humans. So humans killing these wild horses towards the end of the Ice Age, do you actually think that humans were instrumental in the, in, the, in the local extinction of the horses? 
Well, there are two possibilities. Certainly, we've got evidence here that people are butchering them and butchering large numbers. But there's also the question of the change in environment. The climate's changing at this time. It goes from, after the end of the Ice Age, a very open, uh, tundra-like landscape. And then it begins to get very wooded very quickly, just within a matter of a couple of hundred years. And the horses tend to prefer the, the more open environments. So perhaps it was environmental change, perhaps it was uh, humans killing them, perhaps it was a bit of both. These tiny hoof prints frozen in time give us an amazing snapshot of the world of our hunter-gatherer forebears as the Ice Age ended. But such amazing archaeological discoveries are often under threat from erosion. Hundreds of ancient monuments are lost before they're ever studied or even known about. But in Scotland, there's a team working to fight the tide and record as much information as they can before it's too late. The team is the award-winning Scape Trust, and they've made a name for themselves by getting to sites in the nick of time. On Sand Day in Orkney sits a precarious Bronze Age site, uncovered by a storm back in 2005. It's now in danger of being swallowed by the sea unless it can be rescued in time. Tom Dawson has a plan to save it. Uh, the site, unfortunately, is going to be lost to the sea at some point. We don't know exactly when, but it could be the next big storm which will take it away. So by moving the site and reconstructing it, we are saving something for people to come and look at so that they can share in uh, the exciting discoveries made by the Sandy Archaeology Group. The team embarks on a complete excavation, recording each detail for further research. During this process, one find takes them by complete surprise. A Bronze Age well covered by the bank. And we've just discovered that at the bottom, they have actually cut into the bedrock. So the material you can see there is bedrock, and they've made a large hole, built walls up on the sides, but they've just left the back as bedrock, and then placed that lintel uh, spanning the two side walls. And there is a gap, which I can put my hand up between the bedrock and the wall. And presumably what happens is the water would run down the bedrock here and then fill up this chamber. This structure is an astonishing addition to the already impressive site. But being so close to the sea, it has little chance of survival. So the team carefully dismantles it for the move to the Heritage Centre. We've had great support from the local community in Sandy who've come out with their JCBs, their tractors and trailers, and everyone's mucking in and helping us to move the site from here several miles uh, to the other side of the island. The result is that this 3,000-year-old piece of archaeology has been saved instead of being lost forever. It's been an absolutely fantastic effort, and after just a couple of weeks, here you can see the site. We're hoping that people will come here and learn about the site that's been rescued from the sea. So that's a lot of work to save one archaeological site. How many sites do you have like this across Scotland? Well, there are hundreds of sites uh, which are at risk, and we're working with communities all over the place. So although the problem is large, by working with these groups, or at least we're making a small difference. Scape has also been at work in the county of Fife, recording artwork carved into a series of coastal caves during Pictish times. Well, this is uh, Jonathan's cave over in East Weems, and this is one of six caves that survive. These are all very typical Pictish carvings. That was a leaping salmon. Not and a rocket, then. That's not a rocket, no. And this is a double disc and a trident. So if you've got Pictish engravings on the wall, when do those date to, do you know? Well, they're going to be probably somewhere between the 5th and the 8th century AD. And this is actually um, thought to be a Viking boat, and this might be one of the only representations of a Viking boat in Britain. 
So there are a lot of carvings in this cave. There is the largest collection of carvings anywhere in the United Kingdom, or in fact, anywhere in the world. And here, what we're doing is we're, we're using both laser scanners and photographic techniques to make a 3D recording both of the caves and of the carvings themselves. Right, so there will be a permanent record of these carvings for all future researchers. There will be, and this is the, the most um, accurate record that's been made to date. This is sub-millimetre accuracy. That's fantastic. So, are these engravings in this cave actually under threat? They are. They're under threat from a variety of things. There's not only people who go in and occasionally uh, write things on the cave walls. In the past, somebody set fire to a car in the caves, which caused a collapse. Mm. Uh, but also, we have the instability of the rock and also coastal erosion, of course, which there is the danger the sea will enter the caves at some point. So it's really important to create this record. Mm. And I think you've been up in the Outer Hebrides as well, haven't you, where the sea really is a problem? It really is, yes. We've been up in North Uist over uh, in the Outer Hebrides. The site had been reported by uh, local people who have been finding wooden objects, and these have now been dated thanks to the excavation to the Iron Age. Oh, you're right on the beach here. <laughs> One of those little metre-squared test pits. This is an unusual way of digging, but we were trying to stop the sea from taking everything away, so <gasps> the idea was that we could uh, backfill the test pits. This was a problem. The tide was covering the site twice a day, so we had to work fast. So you're, you're basically working at low tide and then you have to just get out That's at high right. tide. Yeah. And bail out. We had to bail out. So, so every day when we came <gasps> down, the, the site would look like this and there would be bailing the site out and then we could carry on digging. But what was frustrating is the, is the speed with which the, the tide could come up. So you might be in the middle of doing your drawing and then you'd have to abandon your trench. Yeah. Come back the next day and it would have filled up with sand again. And then clean up again. Clean up again. Have you finished work there or are you going back? We're hoping to go back in the future, but for the moment, we were, we were just trying to work out what might be there. I have to say, I love the skate project. You seem to go from strength to strength, and I do follow you year on year. It's wonderful to see archaeologists working so closely with local communities and literally saving archaeology from being washed away. Rescue archaeology like this often turns up astonishing chance discoveries. But sometimes, it's sheer persistence by archaeologists that pays off. Researchers in Western Scotland were in their eighth year at Ardnamurchan as they set out to examine what they thought was a pile of stones in a field. They discovered something which had never been found before in mainland Britain, an intact Viking boat burial and they recorded the moment of excavation. And we're joined by Hannah Cobb, who's one of the directors of the excavation out there on the Ardnamurchan Peninsula. Hannah, talk us through your dig. Initially, we thought it was perhaps a clearance can from, from farming. The moment we took the turf off, it was a boat shape, and we felt nervous. We didn't want to say to ourselves, this is a Viking boat burial, but we excavated it very slowly, carefully. This is the point where we lifted the axe, taking it as carefully and getting it in there as securely as possible. But everyone was crowded round and everyone was quite excited to see, so it was a lovely moment for the team. Well done, guys. That's the round of applause. And at that point, you knew it was a, a boat burial that you were looking at. Yeah, and as we got down through the layers, we began to find the artefacts and the fact that it was very clearly a boat shape. Wonderful, shape. aren't they? Wow. So there's that axe head. There it is. It's amazing. And it's actually got the um, some of the wood uh, from the, the handle that it would have been on uh, still preserved within it. Just tell us about the sword. The sword is fantastic. It's, it's actually broken, but it wasn't broken when it was put into the grave. It's broken subsequently because of sort of all the, the things that happen to, to artefacts when they're in the soil. But it's made up of some amazing material. It's got uh, part of a sheath on it, and then on top of that, it's actually got this textile adhered <gasps> on the outside of it. Oh, that's which amazing. Is, it's really amazing. All the way down there, you can see the detail. Oh my goodness, could that be the, the clothing of the Viking himself? Then? It certainly could, and the way it was laid out within the, the burial, it was uh, against the side of the Viking, so probably pressed against either his clothes or, or her clothes or the material that was wrapped around them in death. It was a proper traditional Viking burial then, it, in, inside a boat? 
Yes, yes. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, the wood from the boat wasn't particularly preserved, but all of the rivets of the boat, so over, over 200 rivets from the boat, were all preserved. So did you have any skeletal remains associated with this? The, unfortunately, the, the preservation of the artefacts is amazing and the preservation of the human remains was very poor, so we just had two teeth. But we've been able to get lots of information from the teeth because we've been able to uh, do stable isotope analysis of them. Which is oh, really brilliant. So, so if you've done isotope analysis, do you know where this person grew up? It was somewhere north, further north than here, potentially Norway. So potentially an actual Viking. Yes, yes, From indeed. Scandinavia. Yes. Yeah. But what was it about this site that made the Vikings choose to bury their chieftain here? The team have been working on this peninsula for eight years now and have identified a pattern of burials spanning five millennia. First, they excavated a Neolithic chambered cairn. Then they found evidence of a Bronze Age kist. They believe the Vikings chose to be associated with these ancient burial sites. As well as excavating the Viking boat burial, the team are also investigating the cairn and the Bronze Age kist. It's day one on the Arden Merkin Transistor Project and we are doing an amazing job at deturfing an enormous trench. And who knows what it's going to be? There's bits coming out that might look a bit curvy. There's bits coming out that look like cairn material. That's what we're expecting, but when it's from, who knows? The piled rocks of the Neolithic cairn are familiar to the archaeologists, but the Bronze Age kist contains something very surprising. Crawling into the excavation tent. Yeah. Wow. We've got here essentially. We've just got a long bone coming up there. Wow. Long bone coming down there. So we think that's. The foot's not really coming up, so it might have just deteriorated. There's actually a knee up here, we think. And that kind of mushes up, that's kind of broken off a bit. Probably the pelvis. And the skull fragments are coming up somewhere in here, so it's kind of kind of. So fetal almost. Yeah, yeah. Crush. Kind of fetal information. With this. Wow. Individual crouch burials in stone-lined kists were common in the Bronze Age. But after further examination, the researchers conclude that this kist contains the remains of at least two people, and this is very rare. The Viking boat burial, the Bronze Age kist, right next to a Neolithic burial chamber, means people have been bringing their dead to this bay for over five millennia. Wow, it's incredible to think of that being a cemetery site for, for that long. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously a really special landscape where people were burying their dead for, for, for a really long period of time. And I think the fact that the Neolithic tomb was built there and was obviously very visible within the landscape was something that then attracted people to come back again and again to the, to the monument. And just picking up on that Bronze Age kiss, the thing which really intrigued me from the video was that you found two burials in that kiss. That is unusual, isn't it? It is. It's, it's a very unusual thing. Traditionally, Bronze Age tombs, uh, Bronze Age kiss would have a, a single individual. Um, and, and this wasn't just uh, two people crouched, as you would also expect in the Bronze Age, but it was sort of uh, uh, disarticulated human remains, so bits of bodies mixed up. Potentially, people were recalling the practices that had occurred at this Neolithic tomb. Uh, potentially, this was just the way that they venerated their dead here. Digs like Ardner Merchen tell us of long spans of ancient time with changing burial rituals. But sometimes archaeology and British history collide to paint a vivid snapshot of a single event. In the 15th century, the aristocracy, people like Richard III and his noblemen, threw lavish feasts and banquets complete with grand entertainment, music, games, and lots and lots of drinking. A dig in North Yorkshire has uncovered a feasting hall from this period with evidence of revelry on an epic scale. But they've also discovered how one night the feasting and laughter came to a very abrupt end. For the last five years, a team of volunteers has been digging on the former estate of Sir John Conyers, 
a 15th century nobleman. Every day, the diggers find new treasures amongst the rubble. The site has kept the team busy, logging artefacts pulled from the ruins of this aristocratic banqueting hall. You found it. Well done. It's part of a latch, either from a door or from a big piece of furniture like a chest. This medieval hall was massive. It could hold upwards of a 1,000 people. And in this hall, the powerful and influential met, the movers and shakers of the day. It was here that Conyers rubbed shoulders with King Edward IV and Richard III. This is a site where the important decisions on political power in England in the mid-15th century, the 1460s, the 1470s are made. The hall reflected Conyers' high social standing. And as the team dig further, they find artefacts left over from the lavish banquets that were thrown here. There you go, thank you. It appears to be part of a, a serving dish, either a meat panchion or a, what's known as a dripping pan, which was used to serve sizzling meat dishes at the table. So we've got a bit of food bone. By the size of it, it's a hunted species. We found a lot of evidence of uh, people eating venison and boar, but sometimes other exotic species. Being able to afford to eat exotic foods, such as crane, peacock or beaver, was certainly a sign of high status. But it wasn't just the food that was posh. This is the handle of a one-gallon wine jug. These would have been on the table to serve a half-pint drinking jug, usually of red wine, probably originating in the Bordeaux region of southern France. These feasts were integral to maintaining power and influence. But for the Conyers, their influence would not last. In 1485, Henry Tudor defeated Richard III, seizing the crown. So John Conyers went from being an ally of the king to being a real threat. Eric, what on earth happened to this feasting hall? It was attacked. Uh, a force, uh, we believe acting on the orders of the, the Tudor government, was sat to the northwest of the building and they attacked it for, with cannon. Uh, this is a, a piece of a, a cannonball. So this is a cannonball, it you is, can be yes. sure of oh, that. Oh, we certainly can. You have a series of striations along the leading edge of it caused by it being fired and going through the barrel of the gun. So is that shattered on impact? It did. It was fired into the building and it shattered bits flying everywhere. There are probably other bits lying in there that we've not been able to identify. Probably started the fire that destroyed the building and the collapse event which succeeded the fire, causing the vast area of rubble that, that we found. So what exactly had Conyers done to annoy the Tudors? He was intimately associated with the previous regime. He carried the scepter at Richard III's coronation. He was made a Knight of the Garter by King Richard III. He is alleged in 1487 to have been conspiring with King James III of Scotland to place the Earl of Warwick, who was in prison in the Tower of London on the throne, in place of Henry Tudor. So, essentially, he was on the wrong side. He was most definitely on the wrong side. And what about this pottery, then? Is this, is this high-status pottery? It is very high-status pottery. Uh, it was imported from Flanders, from Belgium, and would have been displayed prominently at the high table and on the buffet that would have, would have adjoined it. So this little piece of pot, I mean, what would that have been it's part of? It's a half-pint wine jug. You can imagine the consequences of drinking half-pints of red wine on a regular basis. <laughs> We found evidence in the form of uh, dislodged human front, healthy human front teeth, right. and other, <laughs> and other stranger uh, things like severed digits from statues. We have three, three severed fingers from statues. Clearly, so these feet could be about. quite rowdy affairs. Yes. Oh, yes, then. indeed. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful pottery, though. It is. Right. It's a type of pottery called lusterware that was very popular in the in the late 15th, mid to late fifteenth century. And it's still lustrous as well. It is I like indeed, that. yes. So we've got this um, this family um, led by Conyers himself, who were very influential 
very wealthy and we're, we're seeing a snapshot really of them presumably at the height of that wealth Indeed, and influence. Yes. What happens after this? The family's influence and power declines after 1513, it just disappears. By 1580, they've declined into obscurity. Konya's downfall is documented by history and the destruction of his hall by archaeology. From Tudor banqueting halls to hoof prints leading us to Ice Age butchers to temples and Roman gods fallen from grace. Well, it has been a fantastic year, so good luck to all our archaeologists in the north as they continue digging for Britain. It's good night from him. And it's good night from her.